My name is Rachel Hoff. I'm the Director of External Affairs at the Foreign Policy Initiative, and I'd like to welcome you to our event. FPI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan institution, a uh, small t think tank that was founded in February of 2009 uh, to promote U.S. international engagement. We are based in Washington, D.C., so we hold most of our events there, uh, but we're very pleased to host young professionals' events here in New York every three or four months and are, are delighted that you've joined us this evening. We are particularly honored tonight to be hosting such a distinguished panel uh, to discuss the impact of the current financial crisis on U.S. foreign policy. To begin, I'd like to introduce Dan Senor, our moderator. Dan is a board member of the Foreign Policy Initiative and a, an adjunct fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. From 2003 to 2004, Dan served in the administration of George W. Bush as a Pentagon and White House uh, advisor based in Doha, Qatar at U.S. Central Command Forward and later based in Kuwait and Iraq, where he worked for both the Office of Reconstruction Humanitarian Assistance and the Coalition Provisional Authority as Chief Spokesman and Senior Advisor. Dan was awarded the Department of Defense Distinguished Civilian Service Award. He's also the author of Startup Nation, the story of Israel's economic miracle, and uh, uniquely qualified to moderate this discussion on the impact of the crisis on U.S. foreign policy. Dan? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for that introduction. Thank you all for being here. Uh, as Rachel said, the subject we're dealing with tonight is something that probably doesn't get enough attention in the public debate about foreign policy. We hear, we have, there are a lot of debates going on in this country about foreign policy. There are a lot of debates going on about economic policy. There are not a lot of discussions about the intersection of the two and what they mean not only for America's economy, but for America's leadership, global leadership, at a time when there's enormous challenges around the world, and Foreign Policy Initiative is trying to spend more and more time on that. Regardless of where your politics are, left or right, uh, I think we can all agree that the importance of America's leadership, internationalist outlook, uh, is, is important for a whole host of reasons you'll hear about tonight. And the debate about our economy has the potential to restrain, depending on how things play out, America's global leadership. And that is what we want to focus on this evening. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists in a moment, but I would just say before we do that there are a few questions that we need to consider. And the format for tonight, by the way, is, is going to be that each, each of our panelists is going to speak for a few minutes, just provide some opening thoughts, an overview, and then we're going to have a short discussion up here that we hope all of you will join. We'll open it up. There's some fundamental questions. One, if you assume, depending on which economic analyst uh, forecast you you believe, whether it's the Congressional Budget Office or OMB or the range of think tanks that have done these analyses, anywhere from, from the next five to 15 years, America's economy, our GDP, could be eclipsed or at least be matched by the level of our national debt. And that begs real questions. Can we afford at such escalating debt levels, can the United States afford the defense budget and the military that we have today and some believe we will need? Can we afford to continue to have an ambitious foreign aid program, which is unlike virtually any foreign aid program from any country in the world? Or another way to look at it, another question to ask is, if we were to rein in those budgets and America were not so present in the international scene, what would the implications be for America's economy? Now, other countries are experimenting with this. You watch the debate going on right now in the United Kingdom. I just was there last week. There's a real debate about the future of the UK's role in foreign affairs because they have decided to, or they are trying to pass a budget that would cut the UK defense budget, which is significant because the UK is probably our most reliable ally in international affairs as far as as long as it means putting boots on the ground. And their capacity to do that in the future, I'm sure uh, Tom will, will address this, their capacity to do this in the future is now, it real. there's a real question about it. Now, I met with one minister while I was there who assured me that the army budget wasn't being cut, there's just all this, they're just getting rid of waste and corruption at the Ministry of Defense, but the army will still be fully resourced and the UK will still be engaged in the world. But there are serious questions. There are serious questions in our own country 
while while many of us were very enthusiastic about and, and celebrated the election results in November, there are real questions. When you look at a number of the members of Congress coming in, Republican members of Congress who support a strong defense and support a, America's strong leadership in the world, they are also posing real questions about whether or not the defense budget should be a sacred cow in our budgeting, and whether or not the defense budget must, like everything else that is going to be put on the table, should not be subjected to real cuts. And then there's a counter to that, which is whether or not actually defense spend spending and spending on our military could actually be the most powerful economic stimulus relative to all the stimulus programs we've experimented with over the last couple of years. So these are some of the issues that FPI wants to start spending time thinking about and talking about, and these are some of the issues that our panelists tonight are uniquely qualified to speak to. Uh, Michael Mandelbaum uh, is, is it, uh, is it just written a book that is um, tailor-made for this subject matter called The Frugal Superpower, America's Global Leadership in a Cash-Strapped Era. He is the chairman of the Department of American Foreign Policy at Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C. He's written extensively on the subject both of America's future global leadership but also uh, the, the striking balance between economic leadership and the constraints involved and America's ability to project power and leadership in the world. Uh, Tom Donnelly, who's the American Enterprise Institute, someone I've known for a number of years, worked on the House Armed Services Committee for a number of years, has written numerous books on the military and the defense budget. I'll just cite a couple. Lessons for a Long War, How America Can Win on New Battlefields, Ground Crisis in Military Resources, which he, sorry, uh, of Men and Material, the Crisis in Military Resources, which he co-wrote with Gary Schmidt, The Military We Need, Operation Iraqi Freedom, a strategic assessment. He's a prolific uh, analyst on defense budget and military spending matters, in addition to a whole range of other national security issues. And then, uh, last but not least, Ambassador Mark Green, who was the former U.S. Ambassador to Tanzania, served four terms in the U.S. House of Representatives from Wisconsin, worked on the, uh, served on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, where he helped craft the Millennium Challenge account and has worked not only in crafting the funding for a number of key U.S. foreign policy, foreign aid programs, but he's now a, a very influential and thoughtful advocate for a number of those programs, who I think speaks quite eloquently to leaders wrestling with these issues on both sides of the aisle. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michael Mandelbaum, who will provide us this sort of big picture here, and then we'll have Tom deal with defense budget issues and Mark deal with foreign aid issues. Michael Mandelbaum. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and let me thank the Foreign Policy Initiative for organizing this meeting and for inviting me to speak at it. It's uh, a privilege and a pleasure, and it's a particular pleasure for me because I have spent many happy hours in this very room. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a wonderful room, even more wonderful when there aren't uh, eight rows of chairs in the middle. Uh, and some of my happiest hours have been spent here, but for all the happy hours that I've spent here, this is the first time I've ever been in this room when I could speak above a whisper. So thank <laughs> you for that. Uh, the premise of the frugal superpower is that someday, uh, and I think in the life of all of those in this room, the United States will get serious about deficit reduction. And when that happens, the world, the political world in which we all live will change. Because serious deficit reduction, contrary to the promises we heard in the recent political campaign, will include both substantial reductions in social programs, including the major entitlement programs, Social Security and Medicare, and increases in taxes. And this will change the public mood towards spending of all kinds, including foreign policy spending. When Americans are getting less from their government, and when they're getting less than what they expected and less than what they believe they are, are entitled to, and at the same time paying more to their government than they ever have before, 
they're likely to be far less generous in supporting everything the federal government does, including the kind of expansive foreign policy to which we and the rest of the world have become accustomed. Now, in the last several weeks, two deficit reduction plans have been released, the Bowles-Simpson plan and the Domenici-Rivlin plan. They differ in a number of ways, but they have three fundamental uh, similarities, which I believe reinforce the premise of the frugal superpower. First, each of them argues that deficit reduction is an urgent matter, and the urgency that they, that they discuss this, this issue and the seriousness with which these reports have been received in the press and the country bring us closer, I believe, to the day when we will be engaging in serious deficit reduction, when we will substantially cut welfare programs and raise taxes. Second, both of these reports emphasize that deficit reduction must be broad in scope. There can be no sacred cows, no program that's exempt. Everything must be on the table. And third, both of them include reductions in the defense budget. And I think that presents a very rough picture of what is to come. Now let me make uh, a couple of uh, general comments about this forthcoming political world and then say a little bit about the changes that I think are likely and desirable. The first general comment is that a world in which the United States has considerably less to spend on foreign policy is a different world from the world in which we've all grown up. In fact, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that for seven decades, since I would say December 8, 1941, when Americans have carried out foreign policy, they've given relatively little thought, not no thought at all, but certainly less thought than virtually any other country in any period of history to how much it would cost. Cost has been, at best, a secondary feature. That will change. It will be a primary feature. Second, because the United States plays such a large role in the world, indeed because, in my judgment, the American global role is unprecedentedly broad, unprecedentedly important, and unprecedentedly constructive, this will make a real difference, not just for the United States, but for the rest of the world as well. A few years ago, I published a book entitled The Case for Goliath, in which I argue that the United States provides some, although not all, of the services that governments provide to the societies they govern to the rest of the world. The United States is, that is, in my view, the world's de facto government. Since I do not anticipate any country or group of countries picking up the slack when the United States does less in foreign policy, that will mean, I believe, that the world will get less governance. And that is not a good thing, either from the, for the United States or for the rest of the world. It's a bad thing even for countries who, whose governments have been severely critical of one American policy or another. Well, what is going to get, get cut and what is going to stay? I believe that the kinds of interventions in which the United States has engaged over the last two decades in the post-Cold War period will be discontinued. Since 1991, the United States has sent troops to Somalia, to Haiti, to Bosnia, to Kosovo, to Afghanistan, and to Iraq. These military interventions had rather different purposes and, of course, were conducted by two rather different administrations, but they had one thing in common. All of them saddled the United States with the unexpected and unwelcome task of what is generally known as nation building, that is, constructing working political institutions where they had collapsed or where they had never existed before. Nation building has proven protracted, expensive, and frustrating. It's never been popular with the American public and it has become more unpopular and for that reason, in combination 
with the fiscal challenges that the United States faces, I believe that we will not see any more of such interventions for the foreseeable future, and we will see increasing pressure on the American government to wind up the existing interventions of this kind in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's also the case, I believe, that the defense budget will come under serious pressure. Secretary Gates has already anticipated this and announced some preemptive reductions, or rather some preemptive reshuffling of defense dollars, because Secretary Gates does not wish to cut the defense budget. But the political forces arrayed against the defense budget, or more properly in favor of reducing it substantially, will, I believe, grow in strength and attract increasing public sympathy as Americans get less in benefits and pay more in taxes. Now, uh, the, uh, the battle over the defense budget is bound to be a contentious one because the defense budget has strong lobbies and it also has strong claims. Much of what our defense dollars buy go to support missions that I believe are extremely important for the United States and I will end simply by mentioning them because it seems to me that the great test of American foreign policy in the years ahead, in a, an era of fiscal challenge, in what I call, in the subtitle of my book, a cash-strapped era, will be to sustain these missions in such a way as to prevent the kind of instability that complete American withdrawal could cause. Those three missions are the American political, underpinned by the American military presence in three crucial parts of the world, Europe, East Asia, and the Middle East. In Europe and East Asia, the United States serves as a kind of hedge, a way of promoting confidence among countries that are not full-fledged adversaries, but are not fully trusting of each other. The withdrawal of the United States could heighten suspicion could lead to arms races in both parts of the world and conceivably even to conflict. In the Middle East, the challenge is more explicit. It is the challenge from the Islamic Republic of Iran, which seeks to dominate the region, which would bring under Iranian control the largest readily accessible deposits of oil in the world, deposits of oil on which the global economy depends. It is important, I believe, in this cash-strapped future, in an era when America is paying less for everything, that the United States continue to carry out these missions in some form. But whether we can be sure that it will do so, I simply don't know. Thank you. On, um, on that upbeat note, <laughs> I... Uh, Turn it over to Tom Donnelly, who can speak to defense budget and military spending more broadly. Okay. I'm, I'm going to speak from yeah. the podium, so I'll be less obvious looking at my notes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, inevitably, in these kind of uh, uh, murderer's row situations, one, one is inevitably reduced to offering footnotes and commentary on what the previous uh, speaker has said. Uh, so here with uh, my footnotes and commentary on what uh, Professor Mandelbaum has laid out, which I think is a, a very useful uh, framework for discussion, uh, although I'm, I'm just going to uh, probably seem to disagree with him uh, more than I, in fact, I actually do just uh, uh, by way of coming at this set of issues uh, from a slightly different perspective. And, and uh, uh, as a... Uh, uh, veteran of service in the U.S. Congress, I'm, I'm very reluctant to make predictions uh, about what Americans will do in their uh, domestic political dialogue, uh, especially now, because uh, as I think uh, uh, former Congressman Green may affirm, uh, there's a whole new crowd coming to town, uh, and this is a new generation of politicians uh, who don't carry with them uh, a very strong memory even of the Reagan years or the Cold War. Uh, so uh, you're getting uh, a new set of, uh, if you will, heartland Americans or hometown Americans who are going to have to wrestle with uh, the issues that uh, we've been uh, starting to discuss. Um, and it's a little unclear 
uh, where they'll come out. However, if one sort of looks broadly over the course of the, Amer of the American experience and American political history, um, uh, the three sort of vital interests that Professor Mandelbaum uh, laid out have, uh, at least since the end of World War II, been pretty consistent uh, uh, and uh, security interests that the United States uh, has worked extremely hard uh, to, try to, uh, to try to secure. Uh, and in addition to the ones he mentioned, uh, there's kind of a larger global interest that uh, uh, overrides or has long overridden the particular uh, interest that we've had in a variety of continental balances of power, and that's access to the, uh, to use the term of art, uh, the commons, meaning uh, traditionally uh, the seas, uh, uh, the skies over the planet, uh, but now also uh, access to near-Earth space, uh, and lately, in, in very recent years, uh, uh, free access to uh, the Internet and to other forms of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, if you will, or electronic communications that facilitate commerce and which require securing uh, very much uh, as profoundly uh, and as uh, completely as does any particular European, Middle Eastern, or East Asian uh, uh, geopolitical balances. And all those tasks, as uh, again, uh, Professor Mendelbaum said, fall uniquely to the United States. So one can be look forward to perhaps a more fugal f future, but whether one can also continue to be a superpower while being frugal at the same time uh, will be a very neat trick. And it's worth, uh, in this regard, just uh, pulling kind of a Willie Sutton uh, uh, approach to the federal budget and to what our economy is comprised of and finding out where the money is. Uh, current defense spending, including war spending, accounts for less than 5% of US GDP on an annual basis. By contrast, the three main social entitlements, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, account for about 10 and a half or 11 percent of GDP. If you toss in all the other federal uh, social guarantees, things like the uh, Children's Health Insurance Program, and you toss in further the interest on the national debt, which is a mandatory obligation of the government, about which the Congress does not vote every year, that number, that slice of GDP rises to about 15 percent or perhaps even a little bit more. And if our current demographic trends continue if we baby boomers uh, continue to age without uh, having our entitlements, uh, which we've come to believe are things that the government owes us, are not constrained. And further, if the full uh, health care program that the Congress has already passed uh, uh, unfolds as planned, that slice of our economy will rise to something like 22 or 23 percent in the next 10 years. So we will be faced essentially with the prospect of either becoming something of a social democracy, not quite on a European scale, but coming close to that, but with the geopolitical responsibilities of the world's only superpower, which means to be a global power, not just a great power, but an omnipresent power in every nook and cranny of this planet. And not only on the planet, but on the seas, in the skies, in space, and in cyberspace, or whatever you want to call it. And the question becomes, if not who, then us. Or then, if not us, then who, excuse me. Anyway, scripture backwards. We face this prospect with a military that I would uh, argue, and as, uh, as Dan sort of read the list of my uh, past publications, suggests that I've been an alarmist in this regard for kind of a long time, so I'm not going to deviate from that. Uh, but the uh, United States military is already in something of a crisis when one measures what it's asked to do, and then reckons, on the other hand, what its capacity is. Since the end of the Cold War, the United States military has essentially been reduced by a third to nearly 40 percent when measured by the number of people in uniform 
by the amount of spending, again, measured as a slice of our wealth, or really any other metric that one wants to use. Yet it's been asked to do more and more. Again, whether these kinds of missions that have been the more frequent diet of the US military in the last couple of years are better regarded as nation building or a subset of the geopolitical requirement, for example, to secure the stability or some modicum of stability or some form of order across the greater Middle East, a theater that now not just only includes the Persian Gulf region, but now also uh, includes South Asia and perhaps Central Asia. And ask yourself, is that something particularly in the context of a rise of a nuclear Iran that we can easily devolve to others, that these are missions that we can avoid doing. I would regard the US story in Iraq as one of being dragged into this uh, nation building or uh, post large scale uh, invasion uh, mission, kicking and screaming over the course of about 15 years. Our story with Saddam Hussein goes back to the moment that he took power in the Iran-Iraq war. The United States has been a very reluctant power in this region. However, if I'd invested in a penny stock called Central Command back in 1981 when the flag was planted, uh, I, I could be in the audience uh, or I could uh, have already retired from my current uh, job because that investment would have risen from a very modest and minimal one to what we see today, when there's something like 175,000 Americans in the Central Command area of operations. The fact that most of them have moved to Afghanistan from Iraq over the last year is merely a change of venue. So the United States has had a long-term interest and made a huge long-term investment in trying to create an Islamic world that the rest of the world can live with. And we're kind of halfway over the fence with perhaps the most dangerous and most fearsome prospects still before us. So when our congressman and our president, not only this president, but no doubt our next president, approached this immense task of trying to impose some fiscal discipline on our government, there are two things that are worth remembering. Where's the money? And what's the demand in the world for American power? Can one imagine a world that's still stable or economically prosperous if one subtracts or even contracts the projection of American power across the planet? Think about the rise of East Asia, the economic rise of East Asia, or the rise of China, which again is a task in human terms, only partially accomplished. The fact that there are 200 million Chinese who live a decent life still mean that there are a billion Chinese who don't, who depend upon a globalized economy secured by American military power for their rise, just as Japanese prosperity has been an effect of American power. Korean prosperity has likewise been an effect of the exercise of American power. And all the Asian tigers uh, that you know, may not uh, be growing quite as rapidly as they once were, but are still economies that are transformed over the last generation uh, and with a long way to go. So we, this is really, no kidding, I, I think an ethical moment where we decide uh, whether we will continue to be, to be the nation that's provided these global goods that Professor Mandelbaum has talked about. But we do delude ourselves to think that we can parse it as neatly as he would like to. Not that we shouldn't be parsimonious or discriminating in our exercise of power. But likewise, I don't think it's you know, likely that we'll be able to so neatly pick and choose uh, the exercise of uh, genuine superpower quite so discriminatingly. Again, we get an immense amount for a very modest investment. Our 50-year Cold War average was 7% of GDP. In the Korean War and in the Vietnam War, that rose well above 10% of our national wealth. And of course, fighting World War II cost us 40% of our gross domestic product. 
So the return on investment, uh, even at the overstretched pace that people in uniform experience, or in pursuit of the sometimes apparently marginal emissions that Professor Mandelbaum talks about, I think it's all part and parcel uh, of, of what the United States has come to do for the world and which the world expects the United States to do and which no other nation or collection of nations is likely to be able to do. So when we think about this prospect of restructuring our government, refinancing our national endeavor, we ought to begin, as the Constitution does, with a, the idea that national defense uh, is the number one priority. And if we can't rein in uh, those social entitlements, our exercise of superpower, whether more frugal or not, is likely to be uh, a lot more tendentious and much more in dispute in many more places than it has in any of our lifetimes. So to continue on a happy note, I now turn the con uh, conversation over to Congressman. Ambassador Green. my colleagues in saying what a pleasure it is to be here and I'm honored to be with them and, and uh, to be part of this tonight. Uh, I will be a little bit more upbeat and optimistic than my predecessor. Let me begin by hearkening back to one of those moments in history. 65 years ago, Harry Truman, in the uh, wake of World War II, took the U.S. presidential seal and modified it. And he changed it so that the bald eagle would face the olive branch instead of the 13 arrows in his right talon. There's a great story that when Truman showed his modification to Winston Churchill, the former prime minister said, Mr. President, with all due respect, I would like to have that American eagle's neck on a swivel to turn to the olive branch or the arrows as the situation demands. Well, 65 years later, I think all of us would agree, I know my co-panelists would agree, that that swivel has never been more important, that uh, the arrows are important, the olive branch is important, but it's important that it comes with the ability to move and to utilize all the aspects of American power. Uh, I am a little bit more optimistic than uh, some others, and I am for several reasons, which I'll outline briefly. Uh, first off, as has been alluded to, while I think our foreign affairs budget, that being development and diplomacy, along with defense, will be squeezed and will be scrutinized, uh, I don't think you'll see the slash and burn that some people have predicted. And the reason why, as Tom just said, is the more closely that our policymakers, our budgeteers, our budget geeks, to use a term of art, take a look at it, the more they realize that defense, development, and diplomacy didn't cause our national debt and can't cure our national debt either. The 150 account, which is the uh, term that those budget geeks use to describe basically all of our development, all of our diplomacy, all of that together, it accounts for less than 1.5% of our budget. Our debt problems are largely due to the economic downturn and the costs of runaway entitlements. And so if you're really going to get serious about taming the budget and addressing our debt, that's where you'll have to look. We are spending two and a half times more on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid than we are defense and international affairs combined. And by mid-century, on our current path, it will be five times more. Uh, the second reason that I'm at least cautiously optimistic about American leadership and American global engagement in the years ahead is that so many voices, so many coalitions are really stepping up to speak up for all the instruments of power, military and non-military. Those voices include business leaders, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which has argued strongly for not just not cutting the international affairs budget, but actually increasing it. They argue that it's crucial to commerce, that it's crucial to job creation, and it's crucial to economic growth. Those voices include military leaders who argue 
as strongly and as passionately as anyone for the non-military portions of the budget. Leaders like Defense Secretary Gates and Joint Chair, uh, Chairman of the Chief of uh, Staff Mike Mullen have argued very strongly for increased funding. In fact, Admiral Mullen, who has publicly called our national debt the most significant threat to our national security, said in a recent letter on foreign affairs funding to uh, the leadership in Congress, and I'm quoting, the more significant the cuts, the longer the military operations will take and the more and more that lives will be at risk. So I think we see more and more coalitions arising that recognize how important both parts of our international affairs and our foreign policy remain intact and remain robustly funded. The third reason that I'm optimistic is because I believe that we're innovative as a people. And I think if we are innovative, and I think if we're smart, we'll use these current challenges, the downturn in the economy, uh, the fiscal crisis that we are facing, we'll use it as an opportunity. If we're smart, I think we'll take a look at our current framework, both our defense framework and our foreign assistance framework, together with our diplomacy framework. And it'll be an opportunity to reassess it, to rethink it, reform it, and if we do so, I think we can make it more effective and more efficient. Over the last four decades, just to take a look at foreign assistance alone, our foreign assistance programs have become fragmented across some 25 different agencies and 60 separate offices in the U.S. government. We've allowed our system to become a bureaucratic maze. It's hard to administer. There are conflicting rules, conflicting authorities. The administration has been developing a plan to try to better coordinate this and to try to bring about foreign assistance reform so that our programs are more efficient and effective. I think as we take a look at this new Congress that they're likely to look at this as a down payment, a first step, but merely the beginning of the process that we should undertake, excuse me, should undertake. I think we have a chance to honestly reassess, reform, and even replace our foreign assistance framework. And if we do so, we can be much more effective and engage in the kind of leadership in the kinds of places where we have to be. An example of that would be the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is one of our most innovative development agencies. The MCC is a different model in foreign assistance, the compact-based model. So instead of simply providing grants to recipient countries, we enter into agreements with them, with conditions, with performance measures, with accountability and obligations on both sides. To me, that's the kind of effective reform and foreign assistance that I think we'll see more and more of in the years ahead. And if we do that, if we go in that direction, you'll see leadership and engagement increase and not decrease. The other reason that I think that we shouldn't think in terms of the U.S. withdrawing or backing off its leadership is that we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking of American leadership only in governmental programmatic terms. And let's be honest, when the average citizen around the world thinks of America, they're not thinking about that government program. They're thinking about Coca-Cola. They're thinking about Apple. They're thinking about those movies and those DVDs. They're thinking about American culture. They're thinking about American and so I think that American leadership continues if we can get our economy moving again. Because as goods and services move across borders, and I would argue that good trade deals are one of the most important steps we can take, with those goods and services, no matter how hard totalitarians may try to stop it, will come ideas. And those ideas bring about change and contribute to our leadership as much as any program, any expenditure that we can possibly make. That's another reason why our leadership remains strong. And I remember back a few years ago when I was ambassador to Tanzania, we had a July 4th Independence Day gathering at the embassy. And those of you who know embassies though, that Independence Day is really the most important day of the year. It's the chance that you have to bring in diplomats from the community but also uh, observers and, and government officials. And 
the speaker that we had that particular year was a young member of the Tanzanian government. I invited him to come up to speak. He had just spent a couple of hours observing Americans in action. We had our fireworks, we had our dunk and contests and face painting and all the very typical American things. I'll never forget, when he got to the microphone, he pulled out his speech, and I had just given my long traditional historic overview of the importance of Independence Day, and he looked at his speech, and he folded it up, and he took it out and he threw it away. He said, look, we want what you have, and we want to be who you are. That's leadership. And that wasn't about the assistance that we were providing, which was extensive. On top of that, it was more about our values, what we stand for. So I think as we take a look at American leadership, it is about maintaining the tools of defense. The defense budget and our ability to project power is incredibly important. It is also about coming to the aid of those nations and those peoples in need on humanitarian grounds. Very, very important. But it's also about getting our own house in order so that we can continue to represent and stand for those values that the rest of the world looks to. Charles Darwin said many years ago, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. We need to be the strongest. And I think to those arrows in that eagle's talon, we definitely need to be the smartest. And that olive branch comes to mind. But I think we also have to be the one responsive to change. And that means that we should take a look at the challenges that we face and embrace them. We're the most innovative people in the world. I believe if we do, we will continue to lead. And I think it's important that we do. Thanks. All right, we are going to, I'm going to try and just use one mic to minimize feedback. So we'll share it. Um, so, Professor Mandelbaum, let me just start with a, instead of a real broad question, specific events that could happen in the world that are just real time, that are here, that are now, or in the next year, or the next 18 months, that if America does not in some way engage, not only will have huge implications for America's role in the world, but potentially for America's economy. One, in just recent days, I think the South Korean defense minister has said, if there's any kind of flare-up again between North Korea and South Korea, the South Koreans will respond militarily in a very consequential way. A, a war in the heart of Asia could have real implications for not only America's foreign policy strength, but for our economy. If, depending on what happens in Iran, as was cited by Tom in the next year, Israel may unilaterally take military action. If Israel takes military action, it would probably be messier, and the chances of success lower than if America had taken military action against Iran. And America would probably have to be involved in some way to clean it up. Uh, regardless of what happens, the implications of a war in the Persian Gulf will have enormous economic implications. Do you not think, when presented with those scenarios, I know it's difficult to present them in anticipation of these events, but these aren't abstract discussions. I mean, these are things that could really happen tomorrow or within the next 18 months. And when those events occur, do you not think there will be uh, receptivity and open-mindedness among the American popular, Amer among Americans, among the American electorate, to the notion that America really does need to invest either at its current defense spending levels or higher defense spending levels to deal with these issues, not only for purposes of American security, but for purposes of America's economic stability? Uh, well, there will be crises uh, all over the world. And because the United States plays the international role that it does, there will be pressure for the United States to do something. But and this is my point, there will also be unprecedented counterpressure arising from the fiscal position of the United States. The two scenarios that you cite are possible, and they would, uh, they would very likely engage the United States. If they do, 
the, the American government, I believe, will make a concerted effort to minimize the extent and the length of the American involvement. If, for example, the North Korean regime collapses, the United States will do everything it can to avoid responsibility for rebuilding North Korea. And let me mention one other event that might conceivably happen, uh, a dollar crisis, a crisis brought on when uh, the rest of the world decides that it doesn't want to buy all the dollars the United States needs to sell to finance the budget deficit. And one can think of lots of ways in which that might happen. If it does happen, and uh, as best I can tell, most people who are knowledgeable about this expect it to happen at some point if we go on the way we are. If that happens, interest rates will go sky high. The country will be plunged into a recession that could be just as bad as the one we experienced between 2007 and 2009. And that would have a powerful effect on the public mood and the public willingness to spend money, not to mention lives abroad, even in compelling circumstances such as those that you cite. Tom, I mentioned earlier the debate going on in the UK. And, you know, it's, you spend time in Europe right now, it's sort of like good Europe, bad Europe. I mean, that's the way the sort of the IMF and the international community is treating it. UK having a serious discussion about austerity, and then you have all these, you know, dysfunctional children, the pigs countries, and the U and, and part of what people point to, the UK having a serious discussion is they're willing to touch the sacred cow. They're willing to touch the defense budget. Do you think that is something here in the United States, the debates in Congress over the next year will point to? Is the UK the model, and are they being the, the adults in the room by seriously dealing with defense spending? And what are the implications for the US if the UK takes a real whack at its defense budget? Uh, well, I just happen to be myself back from uh, a visit to London. Uh, and the, the thing that really struck me, I mean, I think the British have kind of already passed the point of no re return. When you sort of look at the details of uh, what the government's plan, in, at least in a military sense, it, it's nonsensical. Uh, they're going to build two aircraft carriers, one of which they're going to park, just completely mothball, the second of which they're going to build but redesign and then share with the French, and they stop buying planes for their aircraft carriers, and maybe they'll buy planes for them uh, 10 years from now. And they've backed out of the joint program that they had uh, with us to, to build planes. Uh, so, um, it, you know, there is a logical possibility that all those things will come true, but in the world, in the real world, and in the political world, there's almost no chance that that will come through. I, I do think this matters because it's a Tory party that's, you know, conservative party that, that's doing this, um, eyes wide open. They know what they're doing. Uh, you know, they talk a, a good game, but uh, I, I think they've just sort of, uh, you know, this is the final sunset of empire if you will. So it will, I think, at least uh, be used as an argument, particularly by uh, libertarian people, uh, con American conservatives, uh, as a, an exemplar of what we ought to be doing. But in, the, you know, in these times, it's even though the, uh, Great Britain is uh, our most serious military ally, uh, the dichotomy between uh, our power and their power is so immense that it's, uh, uh, you know, qualitatively different. The British Army is going to retain the ability to deploy a single brigade. The U.S. Army consists of 45 active duty brigades, probably 40% uh, of which are currently deployed, and all of which are theoretically deployable. So, I mean, the 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 the, the scope and the scale is uh, not commensurate but it's a dangerous precedent, or it's, it, it is a precedent that we'll notice in our debate, I'm sure. Uh, Mark, uh, on international assistance, there is this perception back here, and I'm sure you dealt with it in Congress, that the foreign assistance budget, there's a perception, the foreign assistance budget represents something far larger than the numbers you spoke to. Why this complete disproportionate, and you see this in the politics of the left and the right, why this complete disproportionate perception about the actual size of the 
foreign assistance budget? How is it blown out of completely blown out of proportion in the minds of of voters? Well, you know, I think part of it is because while Americans remain the most compassionate people in the world, there is this nagging suspicion in the back of their mind that somehow this money is going into people's pockets and you know, down the dark hole, use whatever images you want to use. And I think what we have failed to do, um, uh, those of us who are involved in, in foreign assistance, is to show what we're actually getting in return for it. And, and when I say that, I mean not only what hopefully we're delivering in terms of services uh, with respect to fighting AIDS, I think we've changed the course of human history in Africa, but also what we are getting in return for. The public diplomacy value uh, of many of these programs is extraordinary. Uh, we are more popular in Africa than we are anywhere else in the world, and we have built strong friendships and partnerships which are of great benefit to us in a number of ways. Economically, 40% of American businesses' new markets are likely to come from Africa, but also um, diplomatically. Um, I, I think those alliances are important. We need friends in this troubled world. So I think that's something that we fail to do. Uh, but it also touches on something that's, I think, very important for us going forward and I think uh, Tom alluded to it in his opening comments, a, a lot of the new members of Congress, we have 85 new Republicans, I think it is, in the House, and probably 20 or so uh, Democrats, come in largely as a clean slate. Very few of the elections had any issues emerging on foreign policy. It really wasn't what these elections were all about. But it's not just this election. It's actually the last several elections where issues about foreign assistance and defense, one could argue they should have been uh, discussed and debated, but, but really weren't. Of the 100 members of the U.S. Senate who back in 1993, or back in 2003, voted for the Millennium Challenge Act, which you can argue is the most innovative foreign policy initiative in years, or the launching of PEPFAR, the AIDS initiative, which is you know, this, this remarkable historic uh, instrument of goodwill, only 52 are in office today. Of the 19 members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee who helped to craft these measures, only three serve on the committee today. And so I think what's happened, in addition to the pressures that uh, the professors talked about, is we've taken for granted that there is a constituency that understands the importance of strong defense and defense spending, as well as diplomacy and development. And I think with these elections, people have suddenly turned around and said, well, wait a minute. Here we are, we're having these important debates and uh, really haven't done as good a job as we need to do uh, making the case about how important uh, these expenditures are. And so I think for all of us that's something that's important as we go forward into these coming months and years for all the reasons that you've heard up here and, and the importance of American leadership and engagement. It's interesting, just apropos of what you said, when with the foreign policy initiative was uh, during this past campaign season, the foreign policy initiative was approached by a number of campaigns, Democrat and Republican, that wanted help getting briefed up, getting educated on various issues. Um, and we'd ask them, well, how often do these issues come up on the campaign trail? How often do you deal with Afghanistan? They literally would say never. I mean, never. These issues never. I remember one member running in upstate New York told me about, you know, one out of every 10 or 20 questions he ever got uh, would be on, on Afghanistan. Uh, uh, a Senate candidate, a prominent U.S. Senate candidate, told me that you know in her debates, all her debates, she maybe got one or two questions on foreign policy. So they just, this was not on voters' minds. Okay, we'll open it up. Um, I think we have a microphone that we'll either, I guess, we'll pass around. Hi, thanks for your comments. Um, do you believe that globalization, as we understand it, in terms of open markets, relative, you know, uh, low tariffs, free market of goods, do you think that will continue? Do you, you think the world will go toward more mercantilistic policy, um, and it won't look very much like the 20th century? Uh, the danger to globalization immediately comes not from 
uh, the perspective direction of the role of American military policy, but rather from the impact of the recession and the, uh, the, 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 uh, the currency wars, which are the 21st century version of the tariff wars and competitive devaluations in the 1930s, and those are responses to the recession. If the world does not recover more robustly than it currently is recovering, then those pressures will increase. We know that that's the case historically, and that is, uh, that's the major challenge, and the, the, the structural challenge over the long term uh, involves the need to rebalance the global economy. We can't be the consumer of last resort anymore. The Chinese, the Japanese, the Germans have to consume more and, and save and export less, but those policies are so deeply embedded in their political systems and indeed in their cultures and their value systems that it's going to be very difficult to change. So in the short term, it's the recession. In the long term, it is the global imbalances that threaten the openness of the world trade and investment system. But uh, it is worth noting that it is American military power that helps to underpin that system by imparting the confidence especially in Europe and East Asia, necessary for commerce to take place, and by protecting the sea lanes. Those, I believe, are the crucial American roles in the world that ought to be continued. The other missions that we've undertaken since 1991, however desirable, however well-intentioned, are, I believe, less important. They're valuable, perhaps, but not necessary. If I can just add, um, responding to part of your question, I, I think defense does matter in terms of economic development. Again, I think there are several reasons why organizations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce have come out in favor of uh, strong defense and strong uh, uh, diplomacy and development. Part of it is money doesn't like risk. Stability is awfully important, and so we don't talk about it often enough, but I think it is important. I think a strong military is important for that reason as well. It may be not a primary reason, but sure. Um, if we look at those emerging markets in, uh, in the developing world, the fact that we have a military and a strong defense, I think is important. I think it makes those investments much more attractive and more possible. Can I just ask you, you've written a lot about, Tom, you've written a lot about this notion of a military stim stimulus, that rather than just viewing military spending as a burden that we have to live with, that actually had we focused the stimulus bill on defense spending rather than what we actually did spend the stimulus bill on, we could have accomplished two goals, one of which we're talking about tonight, which is maintaining American leadership in the world through our military, but also there would be an economic stimulant. Can you explain all that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in 25, yeah, no 25 words or less. Um, well, a couple of things. First of all, the size of the stimulus package, let's remember $800 billion, is larger than the defense budget. So if you're going to actually treat that expenditure as a kind of a traditional Keynesian stimulus, it, you might have had a hard time uh, finding uh, constructive ways to spend it. However, um, if you're looking for shovel ready or, you know, quick spend money, um, the, the defense budget could have absorbed a significant chunk of that. In fact, we've terminated, uh, Secretary Gates himself has terminated about $300 billion worth of procurement programs, which are resulting in closed factories, shut down manufacturing jobs, union jobs, largely uh, speaking. And in fact, one of the few or certainly one of the real strengths of the American manufacturing economy is the ability to, you know, uh, produce combat aircraft and other military goods. Um, so it, it, it certainly could have helped and probably, you know, I'm not going to go so far to say is that the Depression was ended by World War II, sort of the sort of cartoon version of why the Depression ended, but it would have probably produced a, a greater economic payback and been a wiser, just in fiscal terms, or again, sort of economic terms, uh, government expenditure and a genuinely Keynesian stimulus as opposed to, uh, you know, 
supporting teachers or something like that. Okay, yes. Not that there's anything wrong with teachers. Yeah. Um, so my question sort of falls to all of you, but at what a large part of the reason why the U.S. has been the superpower it has been is because it's been an economic superpower. So I'm curious on all of your perspectives, it's sort of at what point does running a deficit like the deficit that the United States have right now start to, re I mean, I think it already has started to a little bit, but really bring into question the U.S., uh, America's leadership as an economic superpower and sort of, you know, Professor Mandelbaum mentioned mentioned the potential for a U.S. dollar crisis, and that sort of brings into the question the credibility of the United States from a, an economic standpoint. So my question sort of falls at, at what point does that become a foreign security concern in the sense that, you know, the U.S. has sort of led the way in terms of growth and innovation, et cetera, um, for, you know, history as far as, as all of us in this room have been alive, um, and it seems like that's shifting away from the United States. So despite the fact that we may have um, a military presence in other countries or have foreign aid, et cetera, at what point does our, our um, I guess, economic stability become a security concern where the growth is coming from other countries and maybe some of the smartest minds in the United States are going to other countries to be a part of that growth? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, it hurts us, it weakens us in a number of ways. Uh, one way is that we have far less leverage, in fact, we have no real leverage, over countries that lend us money. And the country that lends us money where we need leverage is China. We've got a problem with North Korea, which is behaving badly. The North Koreans would be shut down tomorrow if the Chinese decided to shut them down. If the Chinese didn't supply them with food and fuel, the regime would collapse. So the Chinese could tell the North Koreans to knock it off. And we could tell the Chinese to tell the North Koreans to knock it off, except that we depend on them to lend us hundreds of billions of dollars every year to finance our deficit. Very difficult to get into a fight with your banker. Uh, there's also the weakness of the American dollar because of, this, uh, because of these ballooning deficits. Uh, we've seen uh, not exactly a flight from the dollar because there isn't anywhere else to go, in large quantities, but we've seen people and, and countries putting money into commodities. Why? Because they expect inflation from the United States. They expect that the way we're going to deal with our deficits is the way many countries historically have dealt with deficits, by printing money. Moreover, uh, over the long term, you're quite right, America's power and influence in the world rest on the vibrancy of its economy. The more money we borrow, the more we have to spend servicing our debt, paying the interest cost, and the less money there is to invest in the private sector and in the public sector. And we really do need public spending in order to build roads and bridges and schools, and ultimately, our economic prowess, and therefore, our power in the world does depend on our economic success. So let me uh, conclude my comments on this subject by alluding to something that Tom Donnelly said. He's quite right that uh, Keynes said that if you want a stimulus, it doesn't matter how you spend the money. In fact, Keynes, in the general theory, I believe, said that if you want to stimulate the economy, you could just as easily fill up glass jars with old pound notes, pay people to bury them, and then pay other people to dig them up, and you get the same kind of stimulus as if you do anything else. But surely, it is not the case that all stimulus packages are equal. Surely, if we're going to spend money, we should be spending money on things that will make us richer in the long term. And building roads and bridges and schools where, they, where we need them and investing in training and education is going to make us richer in the long term in a way that investing in military hardware won't. Look, I, I mean, I, I don't exactly disagree with the analysis. I would just draw the line in a very different place. I would recall our sort of Whiggish roots to say that actually uh, military investments like roads, bridges, it, it is a long-term investment in essentially a public good. Um, and in fact, to return to the original question, I, I think one of our particular problems is the quality of our debt, not so much uh, the size of our debt, although that's 
worrisome too. Great Britain in the Napoleonic era had a public debt that was like two and a half times GDP. However, the financiers of Europe, uh, who knows whether they actually expected a payback to that, but they thought it was, you know, that constraining Napoleon was a good thing to do and worth uh, financing, you know, uh, over, probably over and above their, uh, you know, narrowly construed financial, uh, whatever interest rate uh, they were getting on it. The problem I would submit, or part of the problem, is that the rest of the world is less willing to finance our consumption and our social entitlements. So they know where the money is going. Uh, conversely, um, there is, even for the Chinese, although they have a you know hard time saying this out loud, so they certainly understand that uh, American power has been the framework for their economic development. So they feel very strongly both ways and um, will think twice, uh, you know, and as uh, Professor Mandelbaum said, are even reluctant and feel uh, hesitant about disciplining North Korea, which is about as close as uh, to a slam dunk, you know, obvious threat to them as much as it is to us. I mean, I think another part to it is how we react to our economic crisis. And I think the world is watching that closely. If we take shortcuts uh, versus whether we go after the causes of our debt, that's what I think the world is looking for. They're looking to see if we're serious about taking on entitlements. If we do, I think it has a profound effect, a leadership effect, a modeling effect around the world, because we are still the country that they look to. Um, yeah. But if we don't, if um, you know, we simply, if, if we if we fill up those cups, or if we go after defense, or if we simply take the easy cuts to discretionary uh, spending, um, I, I think we will send precisely the wrong signal. So not only will we be e weaker economically, but I think that leadership role, that leadership image, which should not be discounted, is very important in this world. I think that's what will suffer. So I think the key in these coming months is how seriously our policymakers on both sides of the aisle, new and those that have been there for a while, the veterans, how seriously they go after the core causes of our national debt. Do it well, and I think you see leadership reinforced. Take shortcuts and do it poorly, I think it'll have a tremendous detrimental effect. Time for one more question. I'll let you choose, because I don't want to be in the business of choosing. All right. It's a no-win situation for me if I choose. Go ahead. I would like to invite the panel to just uh, touch on the implications of the recent WikiLeaks incidents on American foreign policy. Uh, if, great reading. Yeah, no, I feel very strongly both ways. I mean, you know, the remarkable thing is how this stuff keeps dribbling out. There's such an immense uh, release of documents that you know, I don't have a clue as to sort of what's still to come uh, in that. Clearly, it's been an embarrassment. You know, conversely, it does show American diplomats to be slightly more competent than one might have naturally uh, uh, imagined. Um, you know, the, we'll just have to, to wait and see. Many of the things that were revealed uh, in the documents are kind of commonplace uh, uh, conclusions. Uh, it does give us insights also into the quality of our interlocutors and allies and partners, particularly of the Saudis, for example. Uh, it's pretty easy to imagine the Saudis, you know, screaming, "You got to do something about Iran! You got to do something around about Iran!" At the same time that the, you know, at least in a private capacity, the Saudis remain the leading funder of, uh, you know, Wahhabi uh, extremist organizations. It's you know, if nothing else, it's a snapshot of the the world we live in and, uh, uh, you know, kind of what we have to deal with. I'm now making the case why we should divest ourselves of all these, uh, uh, you know, terrible uh, adventures abroad. But, uh, you know, it's just too early to tell. I don't really have an intelligent opinion, but I'm going to ramble at length about it. <laughs> 
uh, as a former ambassador, one of the first things I did was to check the Tanzanian newspapers to see if any of my cables somehow were picked up by anybody. And I can report, no, nothing I said was very interesting, apparently. Um, I, I think the effects are the full range. I think it does have a chilling effect with um, some of those with whom we work who um, would otherwise be perhaps more frank and forthcoming in their commentary and their information, and that's serious. Uh, on the lighter side, I think it shows um, um, for those with the, with, with the interest and the ability to sort through all of those things just how messy the day-to-day -day work is in diplomacy, and it is. You know, on, on any given day in all of the embassies that we have around the world, you know, I mean, it, these sort of things come up all, all the time. And so it's, I guess, mildly entertaining, and, and that part is of no great serious consequence. But there are serious consequences. And again, that chilling effect, I think, is one, potentially. Uh, I don't think that the WikiLeaks will have any significant effect on American foreign policy. And so I would like to use my final... Uh, air time to, co to comment on something that the ambassador said. I think he's right that the world will judge us by the way we deal with our deficit problem. And in a previous comment, he mentioned the causes of the deficit, prospectively the huge entitlement costs, currently the huge costs of responding to the financial meltdown and the ensuing recession. But there's a third cause that's almost as big. And that cause is the debt that was run up between 2001 and 2007, taking the American debt, I believe, from four to seven trillion dollars because of the two wars that we were fighting and even more because of the tax cuts that were enacted in 2001. You cannot solve the deficit problem merely by cutting programs, although you do have to cut them. You have to deal with the revenue side as well. You have to get more in taxes. And what have we done in the last few days? We've extended those tax cuts. I remind you all of that great rule of life, the so-called law of holes, which is when you're in one, stop digging. We're still digging away. I, I can't, I can't, I can't, yeah, resist a, because uh, I have owned the microphone, I can, um, you're right, we can't, we can't just purely cut ourselves out of this. We're going to have to grow ourselves out of this. And it is amazing to me that literally days before the end of this year, businesses around this country didn't know what their tax bill was going to be next year. And that kind of uncertainty, whether it was on the tax, uh, tax side, whether it was on some of these regulatory issues, I think is why you have huge piles of cash sitting on corporate balance sheets not being deployed. Not, it's not the only reason, but it's part of the reason. And, and if we hope to grow ourselves out of this mess, I think that kind of uncertainty uh, is, is something that needed to be addressed. So you're saying that it's fine to do the wrong thing as long as... You I'm not saying it's the wrong thing. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, say, I'm, saying, I'm saying it's both we should do the right thing and we should be predictable. All right. Thank you for an illuminating discussion. Michael Mandelbaum, Ambassador Green, and Tom Donnelly. And I think they'll stick around for a few minutes if people have questions one-on-one. -on -one.